So obviously there's a lot to do on this project and our goal is to get the best result possible while sticking to a smart budget, which we'll break down at the end of the episode. And our first step is pressure washing. I'm gonna hit all of the concrete and get as much of the existing paint off of the porch. I'm also gonna try and get rid of this whitewash that's coming off of the planters, but I am gonna be careful not to damage the mortar or any of the stone. If you don't have a pressure washer, it's something I definitely recommend getting. You can see it working here on the sidewalk too, removing a lot of the dirt, debris, and loose gravel. And now we're ready for our first project, which is painting the front porch. And there are quite a bit of imperfections and voids in this concrete. So to fix them, I'm gonna use this vinyl concrete patcher by Quickrete. I'm basically just gonna trowel this on so that it's flush with the existing concrete. That way everything's flat when we put our fresh coat of paint on. I'll make sure and leave a link to this as well as all of the other products that I'm using in the description down below. I didn't use any special technique, but I did use a lot of downward force to make sure that this vinyl patch adhered as well as it could to the existing concrete. It's funny, once I started, I just kept finding more and more spots to patch until we were ready to move on. And to smooth the concrete out now that it's dry, I'm gonna be using this. It's called a honing block. While I was applying each patch, I tried not to let it build up too high. That way I'd avoid a little bit of this work, but there is still quite a bit to do. And this is where I should probably note that all of the tools, materials, and supplies that you'll see throughout this episode will be linked down in the description. That way you can find them. And after that's done, I'm gonna grab my random orbit sander and I'm gonna sand down this whole surface, getting rid of any loose paint, any leftover high spots in our concrete patch, and just getting us fully prepared for primer, which is coming up next. I don't want the new paint to chip any like the previous coat did. So I'm gonna apply a coat of this concrete bonding primer. This grabs to basically every surface so that the new paint sticks great. I'll use a brush to cut in around all the corners and a roller to get the rest of the porch. The only downside is I don't have a roller tray, but I do have a five gallon bucket. This product dried in about an hour and it was ready for a top coat. And now it's time to paint. I've got slate gray porch patio and floor paint. This is really similar to what was on here, flaking away, but hopefully all of our prep and priming is gonna keep this stuck on here for a long time. Instead of masking, I think I'll be able to just cut in with a good angled brush. Honestly, there's already some paint on the bottom of the bricks, and I know that I can keep it way cleaner than that. It also helped there was a tiny expansion gap between the porch and the brick. Now it's time to get rolling. The directions recommend a 3 8 inch nap roller for smooth concrete and then a half inch roller for stuff that's a little bit more rough. I was impressed with the coverage of this paint. With just one coat, I couldn't see through anything. I'm also really happy with the color gray that you get. It's really that just quintessential look. And I painted all the steps except the bottom face because we're gonna be resurfacing the sidewalk later. That's coat one complete. We're gonna let this dry and see if it needs a second. I'll say that in all honesty, one coat would do of this paint. I got good coverage even in any negative spaces. So overall, you can see that these patches look decent, but there is a noticeable difference between the smoothness of the existing concrete and where we had to backfill. Now it doesn't look terrible and we're definitely improving the porch, but I'm hoping a second coat is gonna make it look even better. Regardless, it'll be good for durability. Next, we're gonna wrap these three posts on the front porch, and I'm gonna be using cedar fence pickets to do it. These are just basic four x four posts, except for the one in the middle that's a little bit thicker. I'll start by measuring and making some templates out of some shorter scrap material to make sure that I get all of my miters looking clean. And I know for a fact that I'm cutting my pieces to the correct width. After I cut one edge to 45 degrees, I then took the template piece to the post so that I could mark a line to cut things to the desired width. And the goal here is just to be a tiny bit oversized on all four pieces to make sure I don't have problems with shrinkage over time. Oh man, that's perfect. Awesome. I did a rinse and repeat of those same steps to create a second template for the middle beam. Like I mentioned, it's a little bit wider. I think this is gonna end up looking awesome. I've got a tiny bit of wiggle room, which I think is good. Once I cut the full length pickets, I can always trim them down a little bit, but I can't add wood back on. I'll make sure and label this template so I know it's for the middle beam. This one's a little wider than the outside too. And then we'll start cutting our full length pickets. Cedar is great for outdoor projects because it's water and weather resistant. Plus at Lowe's and Home Depot, these cost like 250. I cut the first 45 degree edge on all my planks, then I brought my template back so that I could set my fence to cut the other 45 degree edge on each picket. 
In total, I needed 12 of these boards and I labeled all of them individually on the inside because after I cut them to length, they were really specific to where they went, whether it was on the front, the back, the left or right of each beam. Before I installed these onto the post, I sanded the cedar with 120 grit just to smooth everything out. And it is crazy how much of a difference it really makes. Cedar is soft, so it's easy to sand. Now let's see how this cedar fits. Nice. And I'm using inch and a half long 16 gauge nails. Perfect. I'm gonna add glue to each of my miters, but not to the post. This seems to make sense with expansion and contraction with wood to me, but if I'm doing anything incorrect in this video, uh, just leave me a constructive comment down below. I made sure that there was no gap between the cedar and the ceiling of the porch. That way we won't have to add any extra trim, but I did make sure there was an eighth inch gap between the planters below. That way water and air can move freely. And cedar is a pretty soft wood, so it's a good idea to turn down the pressure on your nail gun. I'll grab a couple close-up shots, but these posts look awesome. The miters are super clean, and I've just got a couple of really small gaps to fix. To fix this one big gap, I got some outdoor rated wood glue and squeezed it in there. Then I got some scrap cedar and filled the rest of that space. While that glue was drying, I added wood filler to all of the nail heads and any small gaps that I could find in any of my miter joints, then trimmed up this repair with a flush trim saw. And then finally, I sanded everything with 150 to prep it for stain. And it's important to sand this really good without any dried glue on the surface, because if there are any, you'll get splotches in your finish. And FYI, I'm using Cedar Natural Tone Stain and Sealer by Valspar. I just picked this up randomly and I love this color. I see other brands carrying Cedar Natural Tone as well. I don't know if it varies brand to brand, but I know that I like this one by Valspar. And here's how our new cedar wrapped posts looked once they had a little bit of time to dry. A plus. That stain looks awesome. I love those posts being a little bit more chunky too. Now my next step is taking down the old shutters next to the windows that are already half fallen off. And I'm gonna build some new ones out of the same cedar fence pickets that we used on the post. Instead of that whole urban farmhouse vibe that's been popular for the past decade or so, I'm going with a more contemporary horizontal slat design with a mitered frame around it. This should be a really clean look. I spaced all of my boards out one eighth of an inch. And just like the posts, I sanded everything up to 150 grit, and then I applied a couple coats of that cedar natural tone stain and sealer. And FYI, there's an entire tutorial video on these shutters if you wanna build some for yourself. I already released it, and I'll leave that linked in the description. I know for a lot of people, it's really weird that these shutters don't open and close, but around here, having purely aesthetic shutters is really common. It's actually pretty rare to see shutters that open and close. If that's weird to you, I don't know what to tell you. I think because of double pane windows and just really good air conditioning, actual functioning shutters have just gone out of style. Also, people just kind of use drapes and blinds inside to block the sun. Check that out. We're already looking so much better. And next on the list are these planners. And really quick, before we move on, I'd like to give a big thanks to the sponsor of today's episode, Squarespace. If you need a website, online store, or just a custom domain, Squarespace is your one-stop shop, and you need zero website building experience. And now with Fluid Engine, Squarespace's next generation website designing platform, it has never been easier to unlock your unbreakable creativity. With features like their enhanced drag and drop editing on both desktop and mobile. Not to mention, there are no limits to the number of products that you can sell using a Squarespace store, whether that's a physical good, a digital good, or a service product. And if you're somebody that takes payments in person, Squarespace has got you covered. By connecting the Square card reader to the Squarespace app, all of your sales, orders, and inventory are up to date online and in person. To learn more and to build your own Squarespace site before entering any of your credit card info, make sure and check out my link down below. That's squarespace.com slash modern builds. And then when it's time to make your website live, don't forget to use my code modern builds for 10% off your first site, store, or domain through Squarespace. So as always, a big thanks to Squarespace and thanks to you all for watching. And the next thing on our list are these planters. First, I'm gonna fix any cracks or gaps between our stones with a tube of this mortar repair. There were a decent amount of voids and cracks, especially once I started getting into it, the same as what I found whenever I was filling the voids in the front porch. 
all in all, I really took my time though because I did notice a few jiggly stones before I did this step. But once this dried, that was no longer a problem. To paint these planers, I'm using bare exterior satin enamel. This is called enamel, but it is still latex based. So I thinned it down with a little bit of paint. I would say maybe 10%. That way it would soak into the stone and mortar a little bit better and match that texture rather than sitting on top. And it also allowed the stone color to peek through the white in just a few places. It's kind of hard to see on camera though. It kind of tries to blanket it white. I am happy with the look and it freshens things up, but really quick, we're gonna break continuity and go backwards in time and showcase how I fixed this sidewalk. This project took basically over a week and I was doing all of the other steps simultaneously. After I cleared away the dirt from the edge of the concrete, I then mixed up some vinyl concrete patcher by Quickrete. This isn't the resurfacer that we're gonna flood coat the sidewalk with, but it's what I'm using to backfill all of the negative spaces and get things flat. This is one of the worst sidewalks I've seen. Not only does it have a really big crack down the middle that we were able to backfill with this vinyl patch, but it was just really, really water damaged. This house didn't have gutters, and so the water was falling right off the roof onto the sidewalk for 50, 60 years since the house has been built. Don't worry though, literally tomorrow, the day that I'm recording this voiceover, we've got a gutter guy coming to quote. If that's a good price, we'll hire him and we'll get gutters around the whole house. And if it's not a fair price, we'll just get another quote until we find a contractor who gives us one. To smooth this all out, I'm gonna be using a product called Quickrete Recap. This is a self-leveling product that you flatten out with a squeegee and it should just lay flat and look really good. Compared to normal concrete, you mix this up really thin. You want it to be able to flow and self-level. And the squeegee does a good job of moving a lot of material around. Now it says to kind of scrub it in, so I'm gonna do that a little bit. I would have benefited from these bags being 10 pounds heavier, that way I had a little bit more to work with. I got it pretty flat, but you can see it's definitely not perfect in this shot. So we'll do a second coat. I think my technique is gonna be better on this second pour. I'm basically gonna lay out all of my concrete along the back side of the slab and then pull it towards the front of the sidewalk, which is the low spot. This time I used the broom right away rather than the squeegee. I just found I had a lot more finesse with it and rather than digging in and making divots, it really just pushed and eased the concrete around. I thought this was gonna be perfect, but I was wrong. Welcome back. So it didn't rain last night, it snowed and it froze. It's already warm again this afternoon, but the sidewalk, well, let me just show you. The whole last pour is trying to peel away. Look at that. Oh no. I'll get this uncovered and then we'll start making our plan. What I expect is we'll just have to peel away that last concrete pour and then just do one more coat of that quick re recap. Look at it. Oh my gosh. Dang it. We've got some work on our hands. I do want to clarify that this was 1000% user error. I think on the bag it says not to pour this if it's less than 50 degrees, maybe 60. But Oklahoma has notoriously weird weather. Like we're getting really warm days, but it'll just freeze overnight. The weather said it'd be in the mid 40s and I thought that that would be okay. Even though I'd be pushing my luck, I didn't think I would have any kind of peeling like what I got. And what you're seeing me do is another round of this vinyl concrete patch instead of another flood coat first. That way I could backfill all of these negative spaces and get a good flat starting point. And the next day, I applied a coat of concrete bonding primer before another quick re recap. By this time, I had my technique honed in. I'm starting to get a little bit more finesse with the squeegee spreading without making as big of divots, and I've learned the art of using the broom to get a good drag of concrete, making sure that the texture is pretty consistent and the lines are straight. And this is what it looked like 24 hours later, like a new slab. I think when this garage door was originally painted, it was a little bit more charcoal gray, but the sun has faded it to where it's got a little bit of brown texture that really just throws things off. I'm not doing anything crazy though. I'm painting it with some bare ultra pure white just to get it back to its original look. Really my goal is just to make it look like it hasn't been painted. To do this, I'm using the Wagner Control Spray Max, which is this all-in-one HVLP style sprayer. 
Instead of a sprayer with one of those hoppers on the top that you connect to an air compressor, this is everything in one, and it's convenient because the paint is underneath the sprayer. For a little bit on this first coat, I was just dialing things in, getting a good fan, and after tinkering with things a bit, I realized that I needed to thin my paint down just a little bit more before my second coat. Then I could turn up the air pressure on my compressor and I got a really nice fan with good coverage. In total though, I did do four coats just back to back, top to bottom. And we've successfully reversed it back to looking basically unpainted. Next, we're gonna be moving to the other side of the house where we can focus on what used to be some flower beds. You can see that landscape fabric sticking through. I used a chain and the tractor to pull up these bushes with the root ball attached. That way they can be reused somewhere else. Oh yeah! This was a super fun process. I'll pretty much take any excuse to hop on the tractor. It just makes quick work of a lot of tasks, like digging out this entire flower bed in just a few scoops including three or four layers of landscape fabric. It was kind of like an onion. Oh, and thanks to my dad and mom for some help on different aspects of this project. They've been stopping by after work and giving me a hand here and there. It's been a good family project. Plus, we're getting a lead on spring tackling this in February. We'll be listing the house for sale or rent early spring when everybody else is busy doing projects like this, getting their listing ready. In a couple weeks, we'll have a real estate agent come through to appraise. But for now, let's get back to these flower beds. Let's lay down some edging pavers. I'm basically stealing this technique from some short form content where I see people use a line like this to lay out cement blocks or bricks. We've got a lot of play with the margins that we're working with. It's just to keep me on track. Now I need a little dirt under here, that side. So what I've done is I've built up this side so I can compact that dirt down until these two bricks are level and I already know I'm gonna have to build up this right side a little bit to get it where I want. I add more dirt than I need, that way I can compact it back down. And honestly, I think this is almost exactly what we're looking for. Still a little bit high, that's good. You can compact the dirt down more. And now it's time to throw down some mulch. I'm using cypress just for the color, but it's got an added benefit in that it doesn't float. It just stays where you put it. And I was shocked to see that Lowe's and Home Depot both had no plants. I guess it's still because we've got one more freeze before spring. All right, so this front door is in really good shape, but I just don't love the color. It's not too modern or traditional. I really love that there's a couple windows on top for natural light. I'm gonna start by sanding the whole door with 150 grit to get it prepped for paint. I also use some latex caulk to fill in any gaps around the trim in the door casing. So the color that I'm using is called Blazing Autumn, and it looks like that. It's kind of a peachy orange. It's a nice color. I think it'll be really cool. This door had already been painted by hand three or four times in the past, and I could tell by the texture it had. I sanded everything smooth to the touch, but even if I sprayed this, you would still see some of those brush marks, so I just used a roller. And while all that paint is drying, I'm gonna take care of this eyesore, which is the front light and this outlet that they extended underneath. And I found the perfect solution. Not only is this a good modern light that updates the look, but as you can tell on this side, it's got a built-in outlet. I had never seen one of these before, but I think it's gonna do an awesome job of updating the look of this light and then giving us the functionality of the plug without all of this visible conduit. They did surface mount this box for the fixture rather than insetting it into the brick, so that means that our light's gonna be offset from the wall just a little bit, but I'm not too worried about that right now. What I wanna do is get the light hung up, get it wired to make sure that it does Boom. work, and then we'll trim behind it. Dang it, that was supposed to turn on. Or does it? Make sure the ball's at It works. And with that, we are done. Let's go back before we did anything to the outside of this renovation. Yes, it was rough, but it honestly had good bones. It's just a simple traditional ranch, not anything crazy or mid-century. It's almost more cottage style, but I like a lot about it. The stone on the planters, the bricks on the wall, but it was in desperate need of some TLC. So now let's check out these afters. So it's safe to say we've come a long way. Basically every finish and detail in this front has been updated. Aside from the gray brick on the wall, that is, because I just like the way it looks. In fact, that's what I built this whole color scheme around to liven everything up. The cedar with the natural tone stain gives this front the vibe that it has. 
That warm tone pairs awesome with that front door color that we chose. It's not an intense orange, it's a really soft peachy color. There's still a lot of touch-ups to do. I wanna make sure the gap behind this light gets trimmed out and I need to find some gray to paint this little bit of brick. On the to-do list out here, we still got gutters. As you can tell, the rain's just coming right off the roof and we need to fix that. That way our sidewalk stays nice. And tomorrow it shouldn't be raining, so I'll paint the front of that bottom step. In reality, the entire front porch is probably gonna need a recoat just to touch up any white paint that I got places. And the look is gonna keep getting better. Imagine, once there's actually plants. And finally, like I promised, let's do a quick money breakdown. I'll put the list right here, but I basically spent around 750 bucks, give or take, of course. And in terms of sweat equity, I think we've 10X'd that amount of money in the amount that we've increased this home's value. I've got a real estate agent coming in in the next couple of weeks to appraise everything. And maybe I'm wrong. Maybe there's just like a five grand improvement which I think is super low. That's still way better than the amount of money that we put into it. And you'll notice a good amount of that money went to the concrete sidewalk. If we just tore that out and poured in a new one, it would have cost like 20 bucks. But I'm definitely not a real estate agent. If any of you are, please leave a comment down below on how much you think we might've increased the home's value with the project in this video. As always, I appreciate the support. Make sure and click subscribe and the notification bell if you're not already. Leave comments down below, thumbs up, all that stuff. And we'll see you next time on Mike's First Flip. <laughs> It's my first flip. I'm also going to figure out a driveway solution. This is super deteriorated, but we do have a lot of surface area. So if you've got a good affordable suggestion, let me know. Oh, wow. That's a wrap.